I'm Trace Dominguez. On this episode of Research Detectives, you'll see how researchers are working to outsmart cancer. You know how your phone has autocorrect? The way that spell check changes a word when you've typed it incorrectly happens to me all the time. Cells have the same feature. It's amazing. When a cell divides and splits its DNA in two, the cell's autocorrect feature knows that there's a problem automatically and performs what's called a mismatch repair. When the mismatch repair fails, genetic mutations can occur. Then cells stop behaving normally, and those mutations can grow out of control, and the risk for cancer goes way up. Let me explain one more time why the mutations can increase the risk for cancer and why those mutations can make cancer so deadly. The defective cells grow wildly out of control. They can overwhelm healthy cells and either stop them from functioning or essentially drown them. The thing that makes cancer so difficult to treat is that cancerous cells can develop genetic changes both outsmarting and hiding from the immune system. Research detectives at the Wertheim UF Scripps Institute in Jupiter are searching for ways to give the immune system tools to see cancer cells that have found a way to hide. Once it can see the hidden cancer cells, the immune system has a fighting chance to destroy them. Dr. Mikolina Janaszewska is a cancer biologist. She studies cancer on a cellular level, including how cells divide and how they process DNA and build proteins. So what's like the key thing that we're learning from your research? So basically, cells are in the, in the tumor can, can generate this huge mass of cells that differ from each other. And what we are trying to do in the lab is we are working hard to understand how these different populations of cancer cells interact with each other and how we could actually exploit those interactions for finding new, better ways to treat these diverse populations of cancer cells. Oh, so many questions. Okay. So sometimes when a cancer cell divides, it'll kind of get better at being cancer? Is that what you're saying? Yes, pretty much. So can you give me an example of maybe two cells that are working together to keep a cancer tumor alive? So basically, like this, they cooperate with, with our immune system to render the tumor uh, sort of immunosuppressed. So that means that the, our immune system cannot anymore attack the tumor. Hmm. So it's like tricking, like they've got a... Like they've got a, their own key card, and they're like, I've, I'm, I belong here. This is, this is, I belong here in this body. Yes. So what's like the key thing that we're learning from your research? So in our lab, we, we really are trying to um, create um, systems where we can investigate those individual populations with different mutations, and really trying to understand why, why are they together in the tumor and what kind of benefits do they drive from actually uh, being in the same place. And mm -hmm. we also are investigating the local uh, microenvironments, so basically trying to understand what, what types of cells are sitting next to each other, because the gradients of factors that they may secrete actually may uh, help them as well um, in surviving the, the attack either from the immune system or from the drugs that we are throwing at the tumor. I like that, we're trying to outsmart cancer. That seems, that seems like You'd think we'd be able to, they're just cells, but they're doing all of these different mutations that's making it kind of hard for us to catch up. Is that mm -hmm. accurate? Yes. So the hope is that we can, first of all, identify the different species of tumor cells that can be in every single tumor. What we're also hoping to, to do is really to, to find uh, what we call in ecology the keystone species. So basically some of the species that may be really uh, very important for the whole ecosystem. So if you take that one out, then basically the whole ecosystem collapses. Ooh. So that's what we are hoping to find. Great answer, love that. Because it's so easy for me to understand. Like I can much more picture the idea that a tumor is an ecosystem and that if we just have to figure out how to break that ecosystem down mm -hmm. um, because it's not helping us, it's, it's hurting us. Mm -hmm. Dr. Matthew Disney is chairman of the chemistry department. He leads a team dedicated to finding out how RNA can play a role in cancer treatments. You may remember RNA from high school biology. It's short for ribonucleic acid. 
RNA converts genetic information from DNA into the proteins that we use in our bodies. It does a lot of things in terms of changing the proteins we make. And he's already invented a toolbox of techniques to make compounds that act on RNA to stop cancer-causing proteins before they're made. What is RNA and oh. you know, why is it important? So RNA is easy to spell, but it has complicated roles uh, in our cells. RNA does things in terms of changing uh, the proteins that we make. What we're doing is we try to find medicines or compounds that look like medicine that bind to RNA. So if you can target RNA, you could not only inhibit the synthesis or the activity of a certain protein, mm -hmm. but you could also increase the levels of a protein that's silenced. So you're adding, you're, you, you can add or subtract, yes. which, is, which is super powerful. Yep. So you're just targeting those cancer cells and trying to kind of starve them out. Yep, in principle, yep. Wow, that's neat. And how did you, I guess the, the show's called Research Detective. So from mm -hmm. like a clue perspective, if you think of like, what were the clues that got you to where we are now? The, the clues that we use to get where we are now are literally what medicines bind RNA. And then I guess our detective thing that we've been working in lab for a long time is we, we use a computer to help us be our detective. So we write computer code to literally scan a human genome sequence from cancer patients to figure out what's a gene that makes an RNA that causes cancer and do we have a compound that can bind to that RNA to disable it. Now we're in an era where RNA is both the disease and the cure. The vaccines, the Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech vaccines are made of RNA. So we're in an era now where if you weren't aware about RNA, you are. And you're not only understanding the way that it drives a disease, but also the way that RNA can give us hope for the present, but also the future to make medicines. So, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but, it, but cancer is sort of cells behaving badly. So if we can figure out RNA, then we can change proteins and then the cells may not behave badly. Are we trying to get like a cancer cell to just self-destruct? Cancers tend to be addicted to certain genes. So they have, in order to be cancer, they have to make a lot of a certain protein. And so if you can suppress that, then you can cause the cancer to undergo programmed cell death where they'll die on their own. When you say you're making things that act on RNA, I think that's something the audience might not know mm -hmm. what that means. So when uh, you're, why is that important? Or can you explain that a little bit? So if you take Lipitor, Lipitor is a drug that you ingest that binds to machinery that makes cholesterol to lower cholesterol, and that's a protein-targeted um, medicine. Uh, what we're doing is we try to find medicines or compounds that look like medicine that bind to RNA. Mm. So uh, we, that's literally what we try to do as a basic perspective to answer questions about you know, what types of medicines bind RNA, what are the RNAs that bind medicines, how does that then, uh, how can that data set be applied to treating cancer? So RNA, to me, uh, seems like these kind of base code versus like the protein is one level up from that. So is mm -hmm. it somehow better to affect these, like the base code of, of the humanity? Like is that, is that somehow better to, uh, to focus on? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, so I would view that RNA is both the base code and the higher level structure that plays more complicated functions. Another way to think about it is because RNA has these dual roles, you can affect function a lot differently uh, and maybe in new ways by targeting RNA versus targeting a protein. Kind of dial in why RNA is such mm -hmm. an important discovery in this area. For many of these RNA targets that we wind up inhibiting or affecting, you can actually cause the cancer to get reprogrammed where it undergoes its natural, normal cell death process. Knowledge is power, right? And so there's a lot of power in the basic science of genomics, understanding the role that RNA plays in disease, and all sorts of other things. You know, it's interesting uh, to think about a detective, but our detective is really answering a fundamental question to get information and then using a computer program to really do uh, screening you know, in a, in a massively parallel scale where we're looking at uh, the human genome from a cancer patient. How can we disable a cancer-causing gene? And then how can we work together as a team? I'm a chemist. I make molecules that hit pathways. 
We need to work with biologists like Michalina that understand how these diseases originate so we can really figure out what are the important targets, how we can work together to address them. It's all very important, right? I like I like working as a team. Science is a team sport. You, you know, people that, that aren't active scientists think that, you know, a scientist just very insulated, they sit at a bench, they don't talk to other humans and do their work. But it's really a team, right? Uh, it's a team sport. But I'm here to tell you that God can fix your problems. Casey Avwamakpa was diagnosed with glioblastoma three months ago. It's an aggressive cancer that starts in the brain or spinal cord. It grows quickly, and as it spreads, it can stop responding to standard treatments like surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. Casey is an audio engineer, pianist, and pastor. Can you tell us a little bit about your treatment? How did it make you feel, and, and what is it about it that kind of changed your life? I think I've had the greatest opportunity to meet loving people. That in itself changes everything. I think your body responds to how people take care of you and having a very great support system like that just actually made me feel better before I started taking any kind of medications. The fact that people want you well and they want to help in every way they can was a good thing for me. Yeah. Something like glioblastoma, or even just cancer, diagnoses in general, it's very scary for people. Um, when you got your diagnosis, how did, how did you feel? Uh, well, like every other person, it can, it can bring a sudden fear. But I'm a, I'm a man of faith. I, I live my life by the word of God. So when, when we heard the news, and thank God for my wife, I got a great support system. We come from a Christian background. Um, I'm a son of a pastor, so we, there comes a time that you have to leave what you preach. So when we heard the news, I've never been sick. I can tell you that I've never been sick in my life. And this just came like in my blind spot. I got cancer? Where's that? So rather than just being afraid, thank God for my wife, we just held hands together like, God, you gotta show up for this. So we, we, we joined faith together like, we refused to be afraid. And so then once your treatment started, how did that, how did you bring that into that attitude, I guess? How did you bring that attitude of hopefulness and positivity once you, once you got that diagnosis to treatment? Whatever you believe will come to pass. If your faith can say yes, God won't say no. So that kept me all through. I, I thank God for medicine and everything, but what do you have on the inside of you? Now that you've completed your treatment, and now that you're, you know, what, what's the next steps? I've told myself, for God to have saved me is for me to be a blessing to people. For me, I think I got a, I got a better heart right now, a changed heart. So if I was caring, I got to care more right now. The name of our show is Research Detectives. Uh, we're looking at scientists who are looking up how to fix cancer, how to outsmart cancer, how to get it to self-destruct. What would you tell those scientists, those researchers, if they were, if they were here? First of all, I'll tell them thank you for really going deep as much as they can scientifically. I think all of this knowledge comes from the Lord. He gives people knowledge and how to deal with situations. And if there's anything they learned from me, they can use that to tell someone that he works. It works. Look at me. I'm here by the grace of God. And then you've learned um, that you've signed up, I guess, for clinical trials. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I feel anywhere that I can help because y'all have been so great here at the MCI. They. They asked me, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll help. I'll help anything I can do to, to help. I'll be more than grateful to help. Radiation oncologist Dr. Rupesh Kotecha says Casey benefited from advances in radiation treatment. Although the basic treatment paradigm for patients with glioblastoma has actually not changed over the last 10 years, 
with regards to the need for surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy. The radiation part itself has had significant advances. In this case, it was 30 treatments, which is the standard course for glioblastoma. But during the individual treatments, patients used to just undergo x-rays to set them up for their radiation treatment. Nowadays, we do CT scans on the machine to help align the patients correctly for their radiation treatment. That allows us to align the patient in what's called six degrees of freedom. Nowadays, we've actually done research in clinical trials into advancements of the type of radiation. So for example, particle therapies like proton therapy, which is what we have at our facility here at Miami Cancer Institute. Dr. Manmeet Alawalia is Chief of Medical Oncology, Chief Scientific Officer, and the Deputy Director of the Miami Cancer Institute. He does research and he treats patients with glioblastoma. We want the best outcome for our patients. And for that, we have to be on top of our game. And for that, you need the best team possible put together to take care of the patient and support them and their families to this challenging journey. As a cancer doctor, I know cancer can be a devastating diagnosis, not only for the patient, but the whole family. When I see patients with cancer, they're actually watching me too. They're seeing how I'm reacting to their diagnosis. And if I bring hope to the table, that gives them hope. And I think it's a joint journey that we take together. And as a team, I always tell my patients, they are the key piece of that. All of us are working together to get the best outcome for them with the best possible quality of life. And how is it that the research part of it feeds into that, that kind of then practical application? Sure, absolutely. So anything that is researched today may become standard of care tomorrow. So what I'm using or we are using as standard of care today is dependent of that it was put to research yesterday. Also, now we are a big part of treating cancer, as I said, is a team sport. You do want different people to come together, but also we like to combine treatments to try to hit the cancer. Because what is cancer cell? It's basically a rogue cell in our own body that has gone haywire and is growing very fast. So we need to kill it by whereas we try to preserve not hurting the normal cells of the body. My personal journey with cancer started when I was 12. I used to live with my grandmother who was my primary caregiver and she was diagnosed with cancer and as a young and naive 12 year old I thought I would go to United States do research and cure cancer. As a cancer researcher the premise of research is most exciting. That is you can change someone's life that you may never see. So every day I'm trying to help the other physicians being the best researchers they can be for their patients. Technology is playing a key role in advancing the search for treatments, but human connections are also still very important. Okay, very last thing then, since you're both here. So obviously the two of you are very close. Can you talk a little bit about how that happened? Apart from just being a doctor, this just got to me. Like this, this is a special person. And then that's how we just, we just, I think we just connected like that. He, he's, he's got a great personality. We got along with the nurse putting the IV in, you know, and everybody kept telling me, you know, such as how sweet of a patient he was, how kind, how he was actually asking about how everybody else was doing and making sure everybody else was doing great. He definitely has touched a lot of people in our department, and um, that type of personality doesn't come around very often, so it, it's, it's our privilege to be able to care for him during oh. this period of time. Back at the Wertheim UF Scripps Institute, Dr. Kendall Nettles and his team are looking for ways to treat types of cancer that rely on hormones for growth, including breast and prostate cancer. Can you tell us a bit about why it's so difficult to treat cancer? So for breast and prostate cancer that I work on, um, they're driven by the hormones, testosterone and estrogen. So my lab uses a an approach that's called x-ray crystallography. So now I'm going to tell you how we actually make um, crystals in order to look at how new drugs bind the estrogen receptor. We're going to show you a condensed version of that process. We can take a little snippet of a human gene and we put it in a, another piece of DNA that lets it be active in bacteria. They grow overnight and then we can scrape a little piece of this and put it into a flask 
and get, a, get it started growing. You wash everything off of it, wash, wash, wash. Now we've got clean protein. Now we have our protein in hand, and now I can get to the final product, which is making the crystal and collecting the data um, to generate our image of what the receptor looks like bound to our drugs. And then we'll go over here and look at the microscope. Awesome. Oh, wow. They're just little wow. tiny salt crystals, basically. That but, is cool. But each one of these is a, you know, millions of receptors lined up in a row. We ship this to Stanford or one of the other uh, particle accelerators where we can do this. And the, there's a robot there. It has a magnetic base. It just grabs it, pulls it up, puts it in front of the beam, shoots it, and then we collect our data um, that gives us the actual final image. Since I started here, the technologies have advanced to the point now where what used to take us months and months, we can do in a, a day. Advances in technology are speeding up the research process, but the foundation of the work starts with human research detectives using human cancer cells to find potential treatments. In this lab, uh, you're trying to test the drugs or you're just trying to get the cancer cells to do something specific? Like, how is that working? We will work with different types of cancer from the brain, the lung, pancreas, melanoma, and we will try to get them at the point that we can look for new drugs to combat those diseases. In the recent experiments that I've been doing, it's been to see the effects of drugs on the cancer to see if it kills it off. Mm -hmm. Whoa, so that little ball is a little ball of cancer cells from a lung cancer patient at some point. Yeah, in here, how many cells we have in here? We have 250 cells per well. 250? cells for a while. Wow. And so then you'll put a compound into this well and see what happens to this cancer. Exactly. Wow. Huh. Amazing. And wow, I don't even know what to say other than like that's really incredible. Yeah, that's really neat. That's really neat. So then you take these plates each with a one sphere and they go into the robot for the compound testing. We can do anything that we do with the robot. We can also do it um, ourselves. When it's just a few, like that plate, we can do that um, mm -hmm. like offline. Like we can do it ourselves without the robot, but yes, that will yeah. go to the robot and we will give the cells to the engineers. Hey, you guys want to see something amazing? Come on. This is one of two robots at the Wertheim UF Scripps Institute. It's incredible. These robots play a key role in discovering new drugs. Two doctors, chemist Louis Skampova and biologist Timothy Spicer, lead this screening center. These robots are amazing because they can do as many experiments in a day as a room full of scientists would do in decades. So this is uh, our screening platform. We use a fully automated robotic platform to do all the critical essential functions of drug discovery, early drug discoveries. We like to experiment with uh, plates, which are test tubes, okay? 1,536 test tubes in a single plate, and that's how the experiments are conducted. This steamy thing here is called an incubator. It has hotels that store all of the essential microplates that we use for screening. In screening, we do a lot of different other things, including compound transfers and drug transfers. We do that with these cool tools which are called pin tool devices. Pin tool devices transfer compounds from a heterogeneous compound source plate into a homogeneous biological reaction so that we can see the diversity of the compound effect. It's very fast and efficient. 1,536 wells transferred in a matter of seconds. Wow. We have another incubator. In this case, this incubator actually houses all of our compound collection. We have over 600,000 small molecule entities in discrete wells. So you can think about those discrete wells as individual test tubes. Wow. And finally, there's one more key piece of uh, instrumentation that we have to use in order to do drug discovery and get a biological outcome, which exploits light energy, which is really what Mother Nature gives us. You want to explain what this is, Liz? Sure. This is a, the Vulux meter simply images the entire plate and looks at the, the light differences between those that have responded to the drug and those that have not. And, and then digitizes that value that can be exported to a database for further analysis. So that's it, folks. That's Amazing. pretty much how we do it.
The National Cancer Institute reports there are now more than 18 million cancer survivors in the United States alone. But cancer treatment is a journey, and there are many important milestones along the way. So this is one of many bells of hope at this hospital. And the reason it's important is because patients can ring it once they've finished a course of treatment or if they're cancer free and at the you know, end of their cancer journey here. It, when you hear this bell, it's a big deal. Everyone in the building claps. We've heard it a couple times while we've been around. It's incredible and it means a lot, not just to the patients that get to ring it, but to the patients that hear other people accomplish these goals. I'm done. I'm done. I'm cancer-free. When you read this the first time, how'd you feel? There was so much joy on the inside of me, like, wow. This course is done, this treatment is done, I'm cancer-free. That was a big moment for me, a victorious moment. Research scientists are working continuously to outsmart and eliminate cancer, and they're making progress. I'm Trace Dominguez. Thank you for watching this episode of Research Detectives.